Hello, welcome to our look at the respiratory system. Uh, we are moving along with our materials and our content. And uh, before we get started, uh, why don't you uh, kind of sit back, flop your arms down to your side, shake them out a little bit. That's it, relax. Good job. Take a deep breath in and exhale slowly. And again. And exhale slowly. Congratulations. You have officially used your respiratory system and, uh, we know that it is working, we know that it is breathing, and why don't we go ahead and stop the foolishness and get started with understanding how what you just did actually works. Uh, and, and what is the purpose and the function behind what you just did? Uh, and so let's go ahead and let's look at that. So. Um, as we start with every system, we need to understand uh, what are we really learning about here? And so part of that is understanding the functions of the respiratory system, um, which there is no real curveball in what the respiratory system does. Uh, we know that the respiratory system, right, what we refer to as the external respiratory system or the internal respiratory system, um, or uh, uh, external respiration versus internal respiration is another way of looking at that. Uh, what, what, the, what the functions of the external respiratory system and the internal respiratory system is, uh, is very clear cut. Exchange of gas, all right, and that exchange of gas happens in two ways. Um, I have one way specifically listed here. Uh, and so we have exchange of gas between uh, atmosphere and the blood, but we also have an exchange of gases between blood and tissue. And when we look at this respiratory system and we talk about the exchange of gases, exchange of gases, and of course we're dealing with oxygen and carbon dioxide, um, that exchange of gases, if it's happening between the atmosphere and the blood, this is occurring in the lungs, this is what we would define as being external uh, respiration. And if the gas exchange is happening between the blood and tissues, this is happening systemically, and this is what we define as being internal. Respiration. Now, how do we figure one is external and one is internal? Well, I'm glad you asked. See, your 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 upper respiratory system, uh, your nostrils, your nares, your um, your uh, superior and inferior and nasal concha, your nasopharynx, your oropharynx, your laryngopharynx. Um, your trachea, your larynx, all the way down into the bronchi and the bronchioles and the alveoli. All of that is external to the inside of the body. See, that's actually outside of your body. Think about this. This is your pharynx, your larynx, your trachea, your bronchi, your bronchioles, and your alveoli are external. 
not internal. There's a direct passage from the outside to the inside. There's a direct passage from the outside to the inside. And so that air that you're breathing in, that air that is made up of nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and methane gas and ozone and water vapor and six or seven other molecules, that air that you are breathing in doesn't actually go into the body. See, that is why there's an exchange of gas that happens in the lungs. See, we do what? We bring in oxygen. We extract the oxygen from the air that is in the lungs and bring that into the body. It gets put onto hemoglobin. And it's the job of our red blood cells to transport that around the body. So the air you breathe in never comes into the body. It is external to the body. Therefore, it is external respiration. But once we extract that oxygen, once we load it onto the hemoglobin, put it into the red blood cell, and send that red blood cell systemically and that oxygen reaches the tissue and it is removed from the blood and put into the tissue, your cells that make up the tissues then use that oxygen to do cellular respiration. That's internal. That is inside the body. That is within the tissues. And so there is this very clear delineation between external and internal respiration. That is where a lot of our focus is going to be, is understanding how. Because as you've probably come to realize, it can't be that simple. And it's not. Because this is once again a story of the anatomy this is a story of the biochemistry or the physiology, hence the regulation of pH. But it's also a story of pressure gradients and physics and surface tension and overcoming various aspects of physical law. And so there's a lot to unpackage here. Now, I would, I would argue that the first two bullet points on this slide are probably the most important. Understanding pH regulation, which we're going to do, and understanding how these gases, primarily oxygen and carbon dioxide, are exchanged between the atmosphere and the blood and the blood and the tissues. The protection from irritants and the protection from bacteria and pollen and allergens and pathogens and viruses and all that other kind of stuff, that's important, but it's very simple. Mucus that is produced and released within the trachea and along the external respiratory pathway aided by pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium and goblet cells help to extract the pathogens and the irritants. And the aid in vocalization is simply forcing air across the true vocal cords as they vibrate to produce sound. But regulation of pH isn't that simple and understanding the exchange of gases between atmosphere and lungs and blood and blood and tissue is also not that simple. All right. and so we need, to, we need to understand that a little bit better. Right. And so that is what we are going to do over the next 50 some odd slides and the next four videos, five videos, something like that. And so um, buckle up your seatbelts, have your 
Nasal passages clear. Take that deep breath because the roller coaster is leaving the station. I'm going to start you off with something easy, and that is things you should already know. You should already know that the ventricle delivers low oxygen blood to the pulmonary trunk. All right, so the right side of the heart pumps less oxygenated blood into the pulmonary trunk, into the right and left pulmonary branches of the pulmonary trunk, what we define as being the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. And we should know that when that blood enters the lung, it becomes more oxygenated. Notice I'm using the term less oxygenated and more oxygenated. And that oxygenated blood or that more oxygenated blood returns to the left atria ver uh, via the right and left pulmonary veins veins carrying more oxygenated blood because that blood is returning to the heart and that's what we know veins do what you might not know from all of this though is that pulmonary circulation right the amount of blood that is within the pulmonary circulatory pathway is only about a half a liter of blood now you have between five and six liters of blood in you Remember, about 60% of that blood is in the veins. About 20 or so percent, 15%, 20% is in the arteries. And so about 10% is actually always tr flowing through the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins, and in the lungs, in the capillaries that are surrounding the alveoli within the lungs. And in fact, about um, three quarters of that half a liter, about 75 mils, is actually always within the capillaries themselves. This blood is moving at a very high rate, about five liters per minute flow through pulmonary circulation, five liters per minute flows through the whole body every minute. Think about that. Right. One of the things that drives this pressure, one of the reasons why you can have so much blood in such a very short and confined space is because there is very low pressure. High volume, wide vessels, low pressure. And those, that blood doesn't have that far to travel. About 25 over 8 millimeters of mercury is the pressure within the vessels going to and coming from the heart. I'm sorry, coming from, going to and coming from uh, the lungs. And so again, the reason for that low blood pressure is low resistance within the pulmonary circulation. Right? You have a low pumping force. Remember, the contractional force in the, in the right ventricle is less than that of the left ventricle. Right? How do we know that? Well, we know that because I told you that when we were looking at the heart, but you also know that because there's less myocardium physically surrounding the right ventricle than what there is the left ventricle. And so you have a, you have a low pumping force. You have a very broad diameter, very wide diameter, and you have a very short distance by which that blood is flowing. And so that's going to equal a very high rate of movement. Now, to understand this a little bit more, we do have to get a little mathematical. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to get mathematical on you. And to do this, this is kind of where the chemistry and the physics comes into play. So there was a guy by the name of Charles Dalton, and um, Dalton was a, was a chemist, he was a physical scientist, um, who came up with Dalton's Law. And Dalton's Law basically said, the total pressure of any gas is equal to the partial pressure of the gases that make up the total gas. Right. 
Let's say that again. The total pressure of any gas is equal to the partial pressures of the individual gases that make up the total gas. Right? Now that's a little bit different of a way that I that I than what I have phrased it right here. Some of you are probably still trying to write that down. And so I will do you a solid and I will say that Dalton's law says that the total pressure of any gas is equal to the partial pressure of the individual gases Try that again. Individual, there we go. Uh, the partial pressure of the individual gases that make the total gas. All right. So for our atmospheric pressure, our atmospheric pressure is actually equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And this is also known as one atmosphere. One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. This is basically atmospheric pressure at sea level. And so this is going to vary slightly as you get further away from sea level. As you increase um, your distance from sea level, right, that partial pressure actually, or that atmospheric pressure decreases. And if you were to, what happens if you go further away from sea level the opposite direction? In other words, what happens when you go scuba diving? What happens to that atmospheric pressure? It increases. It increases. So when you go down deeper than sea level, atmospheric pressure increases. But when you go up in height, atmospheric pressure decreases. Right. Um, and so to understand this, we have to understand a little bit about gases that make up the total gas. So what, so what are your top three common gases that we have within the atmosphere, well, nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide are the three main gases that actually make up that atmospheric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. So it is possible for us to calculate what the partial pressure is of each of these gases. Right? We know the percentage of each of these within the atmosphere and we know what the total pressure is. And so with that knowledge, we can actually go ahead and calculate out what the partial pressure of each gas is. And so um, for nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide, we can calculate out the partial pressure. So ox nitrogen is actually 78% of the atmosphere there. Uh, that we breathe in. This is one of the reasons why it's important to keep the air external to the body because you don't want 78% nitrogen floating around in your blood. All right? Oxygen is 21% of the atmosphere that we breathe in and carbon dioxide is 0.35% of the air that we breathe in. What does that all equal if we put it into decimals? Well, 78% is really 0 0.78. 21% is really 0 0.21. And 0 0.35 is really 0 0.0035. All right. Um, and so this is the decimal equivalent of these percentages. You divide each of these numbers by 100 and you get these decimal points. Right? So if we look at this, the partial pressure 
of a gas, the partial pressure of nitrogen is equal to the pressure of a single gas, which is equal to uh, partial pressure of a gas times the percent of the gas in the atmosphere. So to figure out nitrogen, all right, the partial pressure of nitrogen, nitrogen partial pressure is equal to is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury times 0 0.78. And when we do that, we find that the partial pressure of nitrogen in the atmosphere is 593 millimeters of mercury. Right. So the of the 760 millimeters of mercury pushing down on you currently, 593 millimeters of mercury of that is coming directly from nitrogen. Oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen is 760 millimeters of mercury times 0 0.21, which is equal to 160 millimeters of mercury. All right. And for carbon dioxide, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury times 0 0.0035, which equals 2.26 millimeters of mercury. Now, these values become important to us these values become important to us as we look at what drives our ability to get rid of carbon dioxide. In other words, to move carbon dioxide from the lungs, I'm sorry, from the blood to the lungs. And what does it take to move oxygen from the lungs into the blood? What I'm going to tell you is that this is all based off of understanding these partial pressures of these gases because these partial pressures of the gases are going to determine in what direction that gas moves as you breathe in. Think of Mile High City. Think of Denver, Colorado. All right. Denver, Colorado does not equal one atmosphere. Denver, Colorado is actually equal to 0.82 atmospheres. It's less than one atmosphere. What does that equal in millimeters of mercury? Good question. It equals 623.2 millimeters of mercury. Why is that important? What we're going to discover, what we're going to discover is that that is less than one atmosphere. 760 millimeters of, of mercury is normal. 623 is a lot less than 760. This is why when people go to Denver, they get altitude sickness. Because the atmospheric pressure is less, which means the pressure gradient that they need to create inside of their lungs to drive air in has to increase. This is why the Olympic team has a training facility in Denver, Colorado, because when they go there, their lungs actually, their thoracic cavity, their musculature that supports breathing has to be greater in order to sustain respiration. So they go and they train there for 10, 11, 12, 15, 20 months. And then they come back to wherever the Olympic Games are. And their lungs are used to functioning at Denver, Colorado height. They come back to sea level. And those lungs are so conditioned to working at a higher atmosphere. They're so conditioned to work at 0 0.82 atmospheres that their respiration, their cellular respiration, their ability to deliver oxygen to the tissues, their ability to do ex or internal respiration is through the roof. Their recovery is shorter. Their efficiency is greater. Their performance is greater. Their output is greater. 
they're working more efficiently. And again, this is going to make a little bit more sense as we go through this, um, or as we go through the next few videos. Right. This is where we're going, though. Keep this keep this slide in mind. So, real quick, I'm going to talk about um, about Boyle here as well. All right, um, Boyle was another physical scientist who said that there was a relationship between the volume of a container and the pressure applied by a gas onto that container. This sound, starting to sound a lot like what we did in the cardiovascular system. And what Boyle said was, Boyle says P1V1 is basically equal to P2V2. The initial pressure within the initial volume is equal to any change in pressure and that change in volume. It's proportional. All right. So um, a one liter container is holding 100 millimeters of a gas and the volume decreases to a half a liter. What happens to the pressure? Pressure goes up. It goes up twofold. Right. What do I mean? Well, well, look at this. Here's one liter at one atmosphere. Here's one liter at one atmosphere. P1 is your pressure one, right? that equals one atmosphere in this, in this instance here. V1 is one liter, that's your V1. Well, if, if your pressure increases, I'm sorry, if your volume decreases to a half a liter, set up a basic algebra, uh, algebraic equation on this. Right? If, if volume decreases by half, that means that you've now taken that same amount of pressure and you've condensed it. So it's going to increase. It's going to double. Cut something by half, the inverse of that is a doubling of the pressure. And so your pressure becomes two atmospheres. Now, and this is where we're going to kind of stop for today, is just kind of looking at this. Um, what drives, based off of that Based off of this example here, imagine if this was your lungs or your thoracic cavity. How does this apply to what we experience within the lungs? Well, we're going to get into this in a little bit more detail, but one of the things that we see here is that the rib cage, right, including the external intercostals, which you see right here, in conjunction with the diaphragm can actually change the volume up within the thoracic cavity and the lungs. And so as you are breathing in, what happens? Take that deep breath in. What's happening? Your external intercostals are pulling on your ribs. They're expanding the chest. And at the same time, your diaphragm, your diaphragm goes from being in a dome shape to being flattened. Well, when it does that, that's its contracted state. When it does that, your chest is expanded, your diaphragm is flattened. What have you done to the volume within the thoracic cavity? You've opened it up. You've increased the volume. And when you increase the volume, what do you do to your pressure? Your pressure drops. And if that pressure within the thoracic cavity in the pleural cavity in the pleural spaces, if that drops below atmospheric pressure, air moves in. That's inspiration. The flip to that is when you exhale, when you expire, expiration is where the diaphragm relaxes and your obliques contract. Think about that. Think about when you exhale. Go ahead and exhale. <sighs> what happens? Yeah, your rectus abdominis, your external obliques, your transverse obliques, your internal obliques, all of those contract to push that diaphragm up. What happens to your rib cage? The external intercostals relax, and that with the rib cage, the thoracic cavity becomes smaller. You decrease the volume. And when you do that, what do you do to the pressure? 
increase the pressure. And if you increase the pressure above 760 millimeters of mercury, you force air out. And that's what we call expiration. And that is where we're going to stop for video one. So welcome to the respiratory system. Take a deep breath. You've survived video one. And I'll catch you on the flip side.